London is one of the most congested cities in the world, with 2.6 million cars packed into the streets. And London drivers spend an insane 156 hours per year stuck in traffic. And you can get fined here for almost anything. I'm Fred of beer for every turn I make. Bad fine veins probably north of 400 pounds. Bro, that is brutal. It's insane. Just over a thousand pounds, and I work here, I need my coffee. In a city that is famous for its public transportation, how did London become overrun with cars? And why are they making it impossible to use them? So all these people here are paying. Everyone right now is in the congestion charging zone. You're paying 15 pounds irregardless. In some areas, roadblocks have been put in place to make neighborhoods safer, which sparked a ton of backlash and kind of did the exact opposite. I think it's a disaster. Now I have to travel 20 minutes around. It's, it's perfect, really. And what this has done is created another invisible barrier. All it does do is uh, create more pollution. I just don't care. Oh, you don't care? Oh, I'm what you are. I wish I was like you, man. Turns out you can also get fined if you're a cyclist. So with such ridiculous fines, heavy congestion, long waiting hours in traffic, and so many roadblocks, who in their right mind would think about buying a car? Um, that would be me. But now I'm really not sure. So I did what any rational person would do when they're looking to buy a car. I spent a week studying old maps, taking the tube, chatting to taxi drivers, speaking with urban planning experts in the public to try and understand how the car broke London. So before I explain this weird position I'm in, I want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes and members. There is something for everyone with a wide variety of topics ranging from photography to graphic design and productivity. I started making videos seven years ago and I'm completely self-taught. I didn't have any formal education or institutions guiding me on how to make films and learning each individual part of the process has taken a long time. And in 2019, I began using Skillshare to build up a variety of skills faster to make me a better storyteller, like this one called Filmmaking for All by Dan Mace. And because I run my own business and I'm also a nerd for productivity hacks, building systems and better workflows, this one from Ali Abdul was great. And right now I'm trying to understand 3D graphics better. And I think I'm gonna jump into one of the Blender classes Skillshare has to offer on this topic. And if you want to unlock your creativity and learn something new, the first 500 people to use our link in the description will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers. 30 days free and 40% off your first year of Skillshare membership. Thank you Skillshare for supporting this video and now let's dive back into how I discovered why it's impossible to drive in London. This story for me starts six years ago when I moved to London. The first thing I did was sell my car because I was like, I don't need it. It just felt like there was no reason to have a car. And in the past six years of living here, I've somehow become a responsible adult and now have a child who needs a lot of stuff. And unless we want to be stuck in London permanently for the next 18 years, we kind of need some affordable transportation that is baby friendly and means we can easily get out of the city to visit friends and family. Hence the dilemma of buying a car in a place that was never designed for them. And to understand this story, we have to go back. Like, really, really far back. It was founded about 2000 years ago in AD 43, following the Roman invasion of Britain. Now straight away, these new settlers had a problem. There is this huge river that flows through the land. The Romans know that they need to build a crossing. So they go out and find a point near two hills where the river is at its narrowest. Eventually the first version of London Bridge is built and the port and trading city of London begins to expand around it. Okay, so a very common misconception when people come to London is that that is London Bridge. That is not London Bridge. That is Tower Bridge. This is London Bridge. In fact, this version of London Bridge was opened in 1973, but we are actually going to find one of the original pieces from the original bridge from like the Roman Thames. Or at least that's where Mac is taking me to the depths of the Thames. Do you know where we're going? Not really. Okay, this plank of wood is the only remains of the original London Bridge. This plank of wood is 2,000 years old. Why can I just touch it? Maybe I, I'm not meant to, I don't know. We're also on like a building site, which is why it's really loud. And there's, there's a bunch of builders looking around like, what are these guys doing? What are they looking at? We're looking at the original London Bridge right now. 
The Romans were known for building these big straight roads, meant for chariots and pedestrians. In fact, much of Britain's modern highway system is based on the roads that the Romans built all those years ago. Anyway, eventually the Roman Empire collapses and a ton of these roads fall into disrepair, and some are forgotten about. Throughout the Middle Ages, London is subject to numerous invasions and different rulers, and London's street layout continues to grow organically accommodating different types of transport. And you can see what I mean today. The city's road network is a mixture of historic streets that date back centuries and modern thoroughfares. Many of these roads in the city center are narrow and winding, adapted for horse-drawn carriages and pedestrians rather than fancy cars like this. But during the medieval period, London's design was already starting to run into limitations. At this point in time, people lived on London Bridge. It's a bustling street and home to hundreds. In fact, for centuries, London Bridge is the only crossing across the River Thames. It means that it's absurdly congested and most people just cross by boat. So a kind of boat taxi service is operated by the watermen. Traveling by boat is a much more efficient way of not only crossing the Thames, but also maneuvering around the busy city. But let's jump forward to the 18th century where things start to get really hectic. London is now entering the Industrial Revolution, and its population starts to grow rapidly. By 1851, London was the most populous city in the world, with 2.3 million people crammed into this city, mostly living in slums. Okay, so Victorian London is mad busy, and they need to come up with better accessibility and transportation. So they decide to build these wider roads. So this is Charing Cross Road that was constructed in 1887. Another major project was the construction of the Victoria Embankment along the River Thames. It involved building out onto the river with a primary aim of providing London with an adequate sewage system and avoiding another great stink like the one that happened in 1858 but also to build a road that would relieve congestion in other parts of the city. However, most of the traffic at the time was carts and not cars. You can see in this clip how packed the city streets had become. By the mid 20th century, cars are a ubiquitous feature of the London streets. The streets have been developed slightly. Things like roundabouts and traffic signals have now been implemented, but there still isn't enough space for them. And the urban designers have to come up with a new solution. As you move to the edge of London, you can see that outer suburbs were extended and they were very car-based. So that were reflected the urban planning and transport planning views of the time, which were to copy the states and give big highway capacity. In the 1960s and 70s, the Westway is constructed. This major dual carriageway runs through West London and creates a new quick and easy route into the city. Its elevated design means that it does not disrupt the existing urban area while increasing its capacity for motor traffic. What's it been like living here? Well, it has frankly been hell because at the moment the lights from the motorway mean that nobody in these bedrooms get any sleep. The vibrations from the traffic mean that you will have a continuous rumble. And what we fear most of all is that you'll get displacement. Look at this British rail ad from 1979, trying to sway public opinion to vote for more rail transportation rather than something that you would see in America. Sorry, America. It's a pretty good ad, but regardless, London's highway frenzy continues into the 80s. Look at this. This is a plan for the M25, an orbital motorway circling the city. In 1986, the final section of the M25 is open. The new ring road allows cars to circumvent the busy center, thus alleviating traffic from the city and reducing congestion. However, the road's construction brings about concerns into its implications on the environment. The city planners did the best they could in making London suitable for cars, but they had their work set out from the start. Let me explain. Cities around the world have different amounts of space to work with when they're building their streets. Plus there is a multitude of social and economic factors that are at play in city plan. London differs significantly from most American cities. Cities in the US are designed in a much more car-centric way, most of them having more room to work with, leading to larger urban sprawls with wider roads, big cars, and a ton of parking lots. Whereas London's narrow streets have led to more compact cars and a focus on public transportation. Lots of its major roads have to weave between historical buildings and famous landmarks. 
and to look at it simply, it still doesn't have all this space to accommodate millions of cars. <laughs> So nobody knows the streets of London better than a black cab driver. So I figured the best thing to do would be just to hail one down and see what they see what they say. Yo, hey man, so can I get in and ask you some questions? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So. What is it like being a black cab driver in like modern day London? I'm forever feared for every turn I make. A fine is just going to land in my letterbox, basically. How much quicker can you get across London than can somebody driving? London has so many variables. Yeah. There could just be a bin lorry blocking one part of the route. It's really hard to account for all of these, you know, when we look at uh, GPSs and things. But because of these road closures, I'm having to think more and more creatively about how I can get round. And what's most frustrating is that years ago, I would have a multitude of options. If I'm thinking, right, I need to get a King's Cross from here or Euston, my brain just alive with all these different options. Right, that's blocked, I can go that way. If that one's blocked, then I can go that way. Now I only have like one or two. Okay. Right. And when they get stuck, I am screwed. Like, yeah. that's the issue. If you want to see an extended conversation with Tom as we drive across London, you can find it at patreon.com slash faultline, along with behind the scenes breakdowns of previous episodes and more exclusive content. Starting from five pounds, you can pay what you like for monthly access into the workings of how we make our videos, and you'll also be supporting us to make more ambitious work. But back to this story. There's also a considerable lack of parking, which means inner city resident areas have cars parked along both sides of the road instead of actually more space for people to drive down the road. All these factors combined cause two main problems, congestion and pollution. So what has the city done to tackle this issue? One, persuading drivers to get out of their cars. This is done by encouraging more green travel, like making public transport more attractive and faster. And the second option is, well, punishing anybody that owns a car. If I'm buying a car, I need to know this, but let's start with the first option. For most Londoners, it's way more efficient to just get public transport. London has one of the best public transport systems in the world. Everybody knows about the Tube. It was the world's first underground railway to open to the public in 1863 and has been transporting passengers around the capital ever since. The underground now handles 5 million journeys a day and in 2022, the Elizabeth Line opened, which connected the east to the west of London. London has one of the most extensive public transport systems. It even becomes iconic with some of the mapping and the colouring of the routes. Here's a hot take. I think I'm going to have a few in this video. I, I'll take the chew, but I hate it. It's hot, it's sweaty, it's crowded all the time. Because it's been around for a long time, it's very old, and that's why people don't like sitting on some of the routes. Um, that have old carriages and are very tightly designed and they might be noisy themselves. London also has a pretty decent bus network, which I'm down with. I use it a lot, but again, depending on the time of day, it can also be hell. No? Retreat, retreat. Oh. oh my God. That was also not a good bus journey. That was a really bad <laughs> And the third option for encouraging greener travel is bike lanes. London has seen a massive uptake in cycling in the past decade, with a 66% rise in the number of cyclists on the road between 2011 and 2021. And the city has adapted to this. There is currently 210 miles of bike lanes across London's road network, but that number is always increasing. The target is to have a third of Londoners living less than 400 meters away from a high quality cycle route by 2025. And my chosen way to get around the city is on an electric skateboard. And as I'm filming this, I'm very conscious of the fact that I look like Casey Neistat. But yeah, electric skateboard. For me, best way to get around London. And this is my commute to the office. It is 90% cycle lane, which is fantastic. And it goes right next to this main road where cars get stuck 
all day long and it's just like a really nice way to commute. I wouldn't want to switch this for a car. Even if I got a car, I wouldn't drive to the office. Like that would be obscene slash another reason for not having a car. Like I'm not going to use it that often. And cycling infrastructure doesn't stop at bike lanes. There is also a plethora of bike boxes, traffic lights, and bike parking stations around the city. In 2023, there are tens of thousands of bikes for hire on the streets. These bike lanes are great, but they are not consistent around the city. In some areas, they are everywhere, but in others, they're non-existent. My cycle route into the city centre is still awful. We need to think dramatically differently for cycling. You know, it needs big effort to get a lot of investment to better cycle facilities. Bettering public transport systems and adding things like bike lanes is an example of persuading drivers to get out of their cars and onto other modes of transport. And I also appreciate that not everybody can be as flexible as me and zip around the city on an electric skateboard. Or have the option to decide if I want to rent a bike or jump on the bus or the tube. There is still a lot of accessibility issues at tube stations. A lot of stops are not wheelchair or pushchair friendly. And a lot of people actually require a vehicle for their job in the city. And if you fall into any of those categories, you have to pay the price. Okay, so let's look at the ways that they punish motorists. Britain's most ambitious congestion charging scheme got underway in London today. In 2003, the mayor of London introduces the congestion charge. This means that if you drive into this designated area between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m., you have to pay a fee of five pounds. This charge has increased over time and today it's 15 pounds. But the concept worked. Vehicle traffic has been reduced by 30%. As a result, pollution plummets. However, air conditions in the city are still poor. In 2016, roughly a quarter of London's population still live in areas with illegal levels of air pollution. Studies are being published that children's lung development is being restricted and premature deaths are still high. This article suggests that London's air is still the cause of 9,000 deaths a year. So to tackle this toxic air in the city, the mayor of London introduces in 2019 the ultra low emission zone, ULEVs. It works by charging the old and most polluting vehicles, £12.50 a day, that drive in this part of the city. While it's a crucial step towards a greener future and a less polluted London, it sparks a ton of debate. So do you feel that it is too expensive? It's too expensive by vehicle unless you've got a motorbike or a bike. Overall, I'm in favour of it. I do understand the arguments about air quality. I think kind of pedestrianised streets are really great. Having said that, whenever I was hit with a ULES fine for my van, it was the most annoying thing and it would have me banging my head against the wall. In terms of ultra low emission zones and congestion charge, I mean, just look to the right hand side of us. To be here now, he's had to pay congestion charge and ULES. So that's 30 pounds. That's a newer Euro 6, that's probably 15 pounds. 15 pounds. So all these people here are paying? Everyone right now is in the congestion charging zone. So if you're not a bus or a taxi, you're paying 15 pounds irregardless. If you've then got an older diesel, you're paying another 15 pounds. Critics highlight the negative implications for those workmen and women who rely on their vehicles to work. And in 2023, an expansion of the ULES scheme to include all London boroughs has further divided public opinion. And it doesn't end with ULEs. These unassuming wooden boxes with greenery in them might be the most controversial visual in this entire video. They started to appear across London boroughs in 2020, and the purpose is to reduce traffic throughout residential streets. These are low traffic neighborhoods, or LTNs. It meant that people could no longer cut through quieter back roads to avoid traffic on busier high streets. The aim of the strategy is to make residential areas safer, cleaner, and overall nicer places to be. So if you drive through here and you're not an authorized vehicle or a local resident, you'll get slapped with a huge fine. Video about these roadblocks. Don't like them. What do you think of them? Well, I'll tell you something. Yeah. When I was driving initially, I wanted to kill the people who made them. Because it was just the most frustrating yeah, thing. Yeah, like, yeah. You can't drive anywhere. But since I'm not driving anymore, it don't bother me anymore. The camera's still working. Oh. Oh, you ain't oh. oh, you don't care. Oh, I'm got you. I wish I was like you, man. Bro, have fun. Take yeah, care. Cheers, man. Yeah? Appreciate right. it here. Yeah, yeah. Bless up. See ya. <laughs> that guy just drove through. It's like, yeah, just don't care. So is he getting fines? Maybe not paying them. These things are so controversial. 
wanton vandalism or a form of civil disobedience. That person just went through an LTN. They're going to get a big, big, big fine. So you have to find alternative routes, and they are not distributed equally across the 32 boroughs because they are operated on a council level. For example, just 4% of Bexley has LTNs, whereas 70% of Hackney is low traffic neighbourhoods. People think it's going to be like this magic light switch where it's just going to turn traffic off, but seemingly it just makes matters worse. It's almost like people are trying to, you know, outsmart the system. It just compounds in another way. What do you think about LTNs? So when they were first introduced, I found them very frustrating, obviously because of my job. It is frustrating getting from A to B when usually it used to take you a minute, whereas now I have to travel 20 minutes around. In theory, they're a good idea, cutting down pollution. However, from my personal experience, they're creating more traffic jams outside the shop now. It just makes things incredibly difficult. I think it is good for not having traffic. I can see where why they may benefit some, but I also feel that they cause problems in themselves. So it's affecting shops and it's affecting everywhere. All it does do is create more pollution with vehicles sitting in traffic because they're obviously then forced onto the, uh, the main roads where there's not enough roads for all the traffic to go. So as a Stokey resident, I actually find it quite nice. I think having less cars on the road ultimately is, is a good thing. This road is a great example of why not to get a car in London. It's a main road, but between 7 and 7, no cars are allowed down here, just buses. So. It makes it a really lovely road. It's really quiet and in a car, you have to go the long way around. So before I make any purchase, I want to know from Rob if he can envision a car-free London anytime soon. You know, it's a big step from where we are. I would love to see that and see everyone walking and cycling. It would become very controversial. And there are, of course, people who need to travel around in vehicles. So that would need to be thought through very carefully how that was delivered. There's other groups, people with disabilities can't necessarily cycle or walk so far, so they, they need to be catered for. The cities around the world have tried the car-free method to much success. Take Amsterdam, which introduced multi-car free zones. In Oslo, they decided to remove all parking spaces in the city center. And in Barcelona, they have introduced completely pedestrianized superblocks where people have the right of way over cars. These zones not only make the streets safer, but allow emergency vehicles to get by much faster. These are examples of the increasing popularity of walkable cities and people taking back the streets. And this feels like the start of something different. Imagine if central London was fully pedestrianised. What would that be like? This is Trafalgar Square, which was partly pedestrianised in 2003. And it's like so much better. It's so open. People can walk around, look at the Trafalgar Tower person. I forget his name. Don't think he was a good guy. You can just hang out. National galleries there. You can chill. It's nice. You ain't going to get hit by a car like I did like five minutes ago on a road around the corner. London is one of the... Whoa. So has any of this sold me on buying a car? No, not really, because at every turn, it's obvious that London is trying to move away from cars. So if I'm not gonna use it in London, it might also be more cost effective in the long run to rent one when I actually do need one rather than just paying for one that just sits on the street. And whenever I do use it, there's a chance of me getting slapped with a big old fine. But I do have a better understanding of the complexities and challenges that current car owners here face, especially in outer London where the public transport and infrastructure isn't as well connected. But as somebody whose everyday life takes place here, the opportunity of making London a safer, greener place that puts active travel and public transport first is not a bad thing. I was on a walk last night with my daughter and I was on a main road at rush hour and I was just hyper aware of the fumes coming from the cars on this road. And I was like, do I really want her to be breathing all this in for the next 18 years of her life? No, I do not. And that seems to be the general consensus. This UCL study points out that 67% of non-car owners believe that there is no need to own a car in London. It's become impossible to drive here because London has entered a new chapter characterized by sustainability and a new version of urban living. Britain has a target to be net zero by 2050, and all this new infrastructure around bike lanes, expanding the underground, electric charging, ULEs, and LTNs are part of a plan for a better future of travel across London. There is a lot more that can be done for sure, but in this future, there doesn't look like there's a lot of room for cars. <laughs>